Hello, I'm Dr. Adam Horsley. I'm a lecturer in French here at the University of Exeter, and my research focuses on 17th century French studies. And this is the first of three videos in which I'm going to be talking to you about this text, which is Molière's Tartuffe ou l'imposteur, known simply as Tartuffe. I'll begin by going through the plot with you before going deeper into the concepts of hypocrisy and of language as they appear in the play. And then I'll finish off with some remarks on the themes of lies and religion as they appear in Molière's text. Yes, it's a comedy, but one with numerous dark sides to it as well, and which proved to be a little more than controversial. And I can do no better to begin, really, than to quote Molière's own preface to the play, in which he says, Voici une comédie dont on a fait beaucoup de bruit, qui a été longtemps persécutée, et les gens qu'elle joue ont bien fait voir qu'ils étaient plus puissants en France que tous ceux que j'ai joués jusqu'ici. Now, Le Tartuffe appeared in several different versions during Molière's lifetime, which I've outlined on screen. The first version, Tartuffe ou l'hypocrite, was performed in 1664 and was made up of three acts. And it was banned that very same year. So there's clearly something going on here that made people really take offence to this text. A longer version, in which Tartuffe's name has been changed to Panouf, came in 1667, and this version is also banned. The final version is from 1669, entitled Tartuffe ou l'imposteur, and this is the version of the play that's studied today. So in this first video, I'd like to take you through the plot, just in case something wasn't clear to you as you read the play for yourselves. Then in video two, I'm going to focus on just three words from one line of the play, and expand on them. And then I'll talk about the themes of hypocrisy, of lies, and of religion. Orgon, then, <clears throat> is a well-to-do man who has been conned, brainwashed even, by a man of God called Tartuffe, after Orgon had seen him acting excessively piously in church and being charmed by him. An Orgon has invited Tartuffe to come and live in the family home, to be kind of one of the family, if you like. So he's kind of a, a, a living guru, really. He's part life coach, but also part spiritual mentor. But there's a problem. Tartuffe is a hypocrite. And I'll explore what that term really means in video two. He's not a man of God at all, but a con man, a charlatan, a devious gold digger who's plotting to take control of Orgon's money, his home, to marry his daughter Marianne, and to sleep with his wife Elmire. <coughs> and it's hard to overstate just how shocking and dangerous it was in 17th century France, an absolutist Catholic monarchy, to put on a play accusing men of religion of being materialistic sexual predators. Also very controversial, and which you might want to look out for in your reading, was Tartuffe using the language and arguments of religion in sexual contexts for personal physical gratification. So uh, another author from this century who I work on was put on trial because, among other things, he'd written a poem describing his female lover as Mon Ange, my angel. It really is that much of a no-go area to use the language of religion to basically flirt with women. <clears throat> so as you read the play, do look out for the language of religion being used not as it should be. All of the characters can see Tartuffe for what he truly is apart from Orgon and his mother, Madame Pernel. They can see that he's someone who preaches being humble, living simply and all that, but who in practice likes fine clothes, 
likes gorging himself, who has a taste for cash and for women. And the thrust of the play is the other characters trying to get Orgon to see this too. Act 1, scenes 1 to 4 serve to outline this state of affairs for us, and it's in Act 1, scene 4 that we first meet Orgon. In the final scene of this act, so 1-5, Cléant sits Orgon down and tells it to him straight. But Orgon is so blinded by Tartuffe that he won't listen to Orgon. He won't listen to reason, which is a common trope in, in Molière's theatre. Molière having his raisonneur, characters who are clear-sighted and who act rationally, who are correcting people who should know better who are usually the head of the household. <coughs> Act two is really all about the marriages. In one to three, Orgon tells his daughter Marianne that although he previously given her permission to marry her love, a bloke called Valère, he's now going to marry her off to Tartuffe instead, so that Orgon gets to have a man of God in the family for a son-in-law. Tartuffe himself does not appear until Act 3, Scene 2. And so there's really a great build-up of suspense, of, of dramatic potential for the audience to finally kind of meet this monster. And Tartuffe, when he spots Marianne's servant, who's called Dorine, as soon as he sees her in his kind of uh, first scene in the play, he quickly starts whipping himself to look religious in front of her before telling Doreen that her, her top that she's wearing is a little bit too low cut and that she should take a handkerchief and cover it up. The phrase really is that old. Then in Act 3, Scene 3, he comes on to Orgon's wife, Elmire, as well. At the end of this scene, Elmire turns Tartuffe down and basically says to him, I won't tell my husband that you just tried it on with me, as long as you don't marry my daughter, Marianne. But then, just as it looks as if Elmire's blackmail attempt is going to work, her son, Demi, jumps out of a cupboard where he'd been hiding and says he's going to tell his dad, Orgon, everything right now, and so ruins Elmire's blackmail attempt. <coughs> But when Orgon hears the news, this is in Act 3, Scene 5 and 6 now, he doesn't believe his own son and sides with Tartuffe instead. Even though Tartuffe openly admits to what he's done and plays his I am a miserable sinner card. In Act 3, in Scene 7, Orgon tells Tartuffe that he is going to sign over almost all of his property and money over to Tartuffe. Now, if the original version of the play really was made up of the first three acts as we have them today, then that means that originally the play ends with Tartuffe winning, with the foolish Orgon handing over everything to the imposter priest. No wonder it caused such, such controversial reactions back in its day. Act 4, though, begins with Cléant asking Tartuffe, what the actual? If you're a real man of God, why do you need all of this property and money? Why do you need these possessions? Why do you need to steal another man's fiancée against her wishes and want to live it up? <coughs> when Marianne begs her father, Orgon, not to force her to marry Tartuffe in scene 3, we see that Orgon begins to falter, briefly, at the sight of his sobbing daughter, reminding us that Orgon isn't a baddie per se, but a blinded fool. Yes, he's got a tendency to be a bit extreme in his uh, emotions and in his reactions, but he's got a good heart deep down. But his wife, Elmir, has a plan. In Act 4, scenes 4 to 7, she very famously gets Orgon to hide under a table, while she flirts with Tartuffe to try and get him to incriminate himself whilst 
Orgon is within earshot. So in other words, she, she basically wants to honey trap Tartuffe. <coughs> and so poor old Elmir gets criticised by her mother-in-law for being a middle-aged fashion-following spendthrift in Act 1, Scene 1. She's then groped by Tartuffe in Act 3, Scene 3. And now she's putting herself at risk, certainly within his reach, uh, at the risk of having more of the same, more unwanted, amorous advances from Tartuffe. Arfaux de Vaux smells a rat at Elmio's change of heart, but eventually he takes the bait. And when Orgon leaps out from under the table in scene six to confront Tartuffe, he tries to throw him out. And that's when Tartuffe finally lets his, his mask of piety slip and instead reminds Orgon, I think you'll find that this house belongs to me now and I want you guys all out. This now takes us to the final act. It's a much quicker play if you, if you read it thoroughly. A uh, longer play, sorry, if you um, don't skip through the lines. In Act 5, Scene 3, Madame Pernelle still can't believe what is happening, despite Orgon repeatedly saying to her, Mum, you're not listening. I saw him with my own eyes. I heard his language of love towards my wife with my own ears. <coughs> and whilst the family bicker, Tartuffe isn't just sitting there idly enjoying his newly acquired flat screen telly. Instead, he ratchets up the pressure. In Act 5, Scene 4, Monsieur Loyal, whom we might liken to a modern bailiff, turns up to tell the family that they've got until the morning to vacate the premises. Then in Scene 6, things get worse. Valère, who if you remember is Marianne's former fiancé, tells Orgon that Tartuffe has reported Orgon to the king, Louis XIV, Louis XIV, for being a traitor to the crown. Which he isn't, incidentally. He's just been hiding incriminating papers belonging to someone called Argar, who was. And that as a result of this, Orgon now faces imprisonment by the king. Louis XIV, the Sun King, the very person in front of whom this play was originally played. And that takes us to the final scene of the play. Tartuffe and the exalt, so a kind of policeman, turn up, and Tartuffe says to him, pointing at Orgon, arrest this man. And in a shock twist, the exalt turns around and claps the handcuffs onto Tartuffe instead. So a very different ending to the original three-act play. The exempt tells us on screen here that basically there's no fooling Louis XIV. The king was made aware of Tartuffe before. He's a serial imposter with several aliases. The king also knows that, uh, that Orgon is a loyal subject and rewards him for this loyalty by stripping Tartuffe of all of the goods that he'd stolen and giving it all back to Orgon. <coughs> Orgon, in turn, thanks Valère, who had helped Orgon out when all seemed lost, by letting him marry his daughter Marianne instead, after all. The end. And, and the end, the end here, incidentally, resembles a motif more common in 16th century Renaissance tragedy, a deus ex machina, an ending in which God, or the gods, with a lowercase g, swoops in at the end to save the day, at the moment when all seems lost for the hero, for the main characters. Except that here, it's the king that does this, so it's kind of a rex ex machina, if you like. That is a very, very shamefully uh, uh, kind of quick, brief run through of the plot. And there's far much more to discover as you read it through line by line. And in video two, I'll explain what the term hypocrisy might mean for us in the play and why it was so controversial before talking about how this play deals with the themes of language, 
and of lives. I'll see you then.